as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomenon. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. Everybody's ready to get jiggy with it. I have with me David German. Say hi. <laughs> hey, what's up? All right. Nightmare Nerd and House of Tortured Souls contributor Daniel Ryan. Greetings, my fellow horror fanatics. And Jen's Brewing, uh, social media consultant and uh, my horrific life podcaster, Erica Wright. <laughs> hi. Hi. All right. <laughs> oh, so just i I've, I've been i have a routine where we talk about the 10 best you know movies of a filmmaker or actor and or we do a franchise discussion and tonight's the latter where we tackle scott derrickson's and blumhouse's uh sinister franchise did it live up to expectations or was it half and half or was it disappointment let's tackle uh movie number one released in 2012 uh, it was a surprise hit, and uh, uh, co-starred uh, Ethan Hawke, James Ranzone, uh, Julia Rylance, and an uncredited Vincent D'Onofrio. So, it was uh, inspired by The Ring, but uh, did anyone get any inspirations or similarities to stuff like Amityville Horror or uh, Omen? Uh, Amityville, I can see. Not as much The Omen. Okay. No, I'm thinking more of the second one, but we'll get to that. Um, That's true. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I've already been a fan of Scott Derrickson, just with his other material, like Deliver Us from Evil and Hellraiser uh, 5, but I, I was just like, this one, just, for whatever reason, I just, it really made good use of the documentary filmmaking, but I'll, I'll, I'll go around. Uh, Erica, well, let's, let's take down on this. <laughs> yeah, I... I really enjoyed both movies. The, the second one a bit less so. Um, I actually saw them both in the theater. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and I saw the second one in the theater despite having a really bad Metacritic score when that came out. Yeah, it's I, it's hard because... It was, I felt like it was underrated. I thought it was an all right movie. Not yeah. as creepy as the first one, though. Oh, good. Um... I see a lot of people complaining about why are they always in the dark, and it's like, <laughs> I, I just let it go. Uh, stuff like that, you know, it's just everyone's just so, shitting their pants, just not sure if they even want to move. We'll return after these messages. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? Not enough podcasts about movies in your life? Why not try? They must be destroyed on sight! The new podcast cure all, sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation, we have Italian horror, we have zombies, we have slashers, we have crime films, we have spaghetti westerns, we even have sci fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of They Must Be Destroyed on Sight as needed and let the hosts Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest host cure what ails you. Warning may cause atrophy. African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin cough, colic, cramp colic, dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, mortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening. Hey. 
Hey, I heard you like movies. I heard you like to hustle. I heard you like podcasts. Well, guess what? There's a podcast for you out there called The Home Video Hustle. Damn right. Every Friday, we talk about whatever movie PJ picks out the bag. What does that mean? Every Wednesday on our YouTube page, I put a bunch of movies in a bag, and PJ picks one out at random. Mm -hmm. And then we just watch it. We talk about it for maybe like an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Whatever we feel like doing, wherever the conversation leads us. But do we actually talk about the movie? Most of the time. Ah. Tangents galore. Yes. So believe me, we may be a movie podcast, but it's not always about movies. We might talk about video games. Mm -hmm. Music. music. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's mm -hmm. the big one, music. Uh, sometimes we might get a little bit of politicalness in there. Yes. Sometimes we may just, oh, we know what we like to do. We like to tell stories, PJ. Ah, yes. I am the master storyteller <laughs> yes. of the podcast realm. <laughs> Undefeated. So if you like to hear about movies, video games, whatever foolishness comes to our mind, the most random stuff you can think of, check out the Home Video Hustle. You can find us on the Stitchers, yes. the Google Play, yes. Apple Podcasts, what else? Podbean, what else? Podcast Addict, goddamn, all that. Ain't no reason you can't get your hustle on. We everywhere, worldwide, baby. Hustle, motherfucking hustle. Hey, we can't cuss in the promo, PJ. Ah, we gotta be family friendly. There may be podcasts out there that don't want us here to say, ah, 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 ah. All that good fun <laughs> stuff. Well. <laughs> you yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't run the listeners away Pete. Ah, i'm sorry but this is going kind of long yes so we'll end this and say hey check out the home video hustle every friday on all the various podcast outlets peace peace as far back as i can remember i always wanted to be a gangster and while Witch didn't make it to the top of the world, he did make the Gangs of Hollywood podcast. So join the gang and enjoy a movie review podcast about movie gangs, gangsters, mobsters, and the mayhem they cause. You can find GOH Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at GOHpod at www.gohpod.com as well as your favorite podcast listening app. And remember, say hello to your little friend for me. If you take two old punk rockers who are past their prime, put them in front of a movie screen and give them a podcast, what do you get? Cinema punks. Cinepunks. It's the mixtape of movies. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Uh, necrophilia. Uh, yeah. uh, uh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, prudes. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. Oh, I'm still tripping out over that. <laughs> Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get it's out of it. unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this movie. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you should be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this movie. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this, like, little nerd glee with everything that kept Little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you, you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped from watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was How did you watch one. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. Latest time, let's check our cue, baby. Pair it with a couple brews, baby. We love your movies. We love the bad ones, too.
So we watch them all and pass their lessons on to you. Oh yeah. Everything I learned from movies helps to make life a little bit groovy. With a one last plot holes a gratuitous boobies. It's time to get busy with your friend Steven Izzy. At EILFM.podbean.com. We now continue with our program. Uh, I've seen other people compare this to Derrickson's earlier work, uh, Emily Rose, as well as movies like The Shining, Manhunter, and The Conversation. There's definitely a cool mystery element, and I think that's why it also did pretty well. It's both mystery and horror. Uh, always good to have a French uh, genre mashup. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, apparently, the Super 8 segments of this movie were shot first. And I'm like, well, that makes a lot of sense because that definitely was the mo- material that they played on the most. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan Hawke's character was named after comedian uh, Patton Oswald and writer Harlan Ellison. <laughs> huh. Well, I, gu- I guess that's why his character is pretty cynical. He's got the best of both worlds. <laughs> nice, nice. He's uh he's kind of a dick in this, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I you know, and a lot of people said that the deal breaker for him was the ending. You know, I was okay with the ending kind of just being, you know, you know, an evil ending. I just because it's just typical with these kinds of movies. Just don't you know have the the plot twist there at the very last minute and make it feel like an afterthought. That I, I I go with anything as long as it's you know. I felt like the uh, the the um, the demon, not a demon. What do they call it? An, an, not an entity. Uh, um, He's like a Babylonian god. Babul. Babul. Yeah, Babul. Babul. Yes, that's it that's the name. It seems to me that he was, at least in this, or I could be reading too much into it, with sort of a metaphor for Ethan Hawke's character's shitty parenting and husbanding. You know, uh-huh. he's he's totally an absent father. He claims not to be, but he locks himself in his office. He's in denial. Him. Yeah. And the fact that he even brought them to this house is what puts his family in jeopardy. I, I got the feeling that that was sort of a metaphor for his uh, being a terrible parent and uh, and husband. Because uh, that's what he he brought it upon them, you know, through his selfishness. Yeah, very very much so. Mm-hmm. It, it it's definitely uh, 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 it, it's basically just. When someone, it's uh, that's definitely the direct shining line there. Except you know, instead of just losing his mind, he literally is just so oblivious to how self indulgent he is. But I like how the movie itself. He becomes obsessed, just like in The Shining. Yeah, he becomes obsessed for sort of different reasons. Yeah. Explain me why was why was Bagul wearing a sport coat? Someone want to explain that to me? That's a good question. (laughs) <laughs> I, I I know that some of the images were inspired by black metal, which is a Norwegian thing. But uh, uh, that one I think I think they were just trying to show how he's all just kind of more modern and hip. And uh, I, I like how they're so cruel to the deputy, calling him so and so. I was like, man, I what love a love that character. <laughs> yeah, uh, and what what a disrespectful way to just 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 shit on him and just be like, and, yeah, it, and the nothing. Sequel. Dude, they never even give him a name in the sequel, and he's the main character at that point. He's still, then he's ex deputy so and so, which was a, yeah, I thought that was pretty damn funny. Yeah, uh, did, did you get a real father Karis vibe off of him in this? I, he, he I like, think that's totally it. Is like the people who care are the people who don't get any respect. And don't get me wrong, we this I, I'm not going to tie into today's uh, uh, material, but I, I think it's just a simple, just this guy because he's. I mean, I get this a lot as a security guard, so I'll just say this. He, because he's younger, you know, like, Ethan Hawke's, like, middle age. He's, like, late 30s, early 40s. So, you know, yeah, he's, like, uh, because he's younger, he looks younger, He's hasn't been on the job long enough, and, you know, he's got no respect. He's just like, okay, move along, cool, nice to know. <laughs> and uh, brilliant uh, Derrickson to... Uh, bring uh, Christopher Young, who scored his previous movies, you know, of Hellraiser fame, to do the score for this. It definitely creates the eeriness. Um, that was the, the use of Santa music was very good in this. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
I saw it was co-produced with Alliance Films. Was this filmed in Canada? I, I couldn't find any, anything on that where it was filmed. Oh, uh, it began. Yeah, no, I got nothing. Oh, wait. It was filmed on Long Island. Holy shit. Okay, in New York. So, okay. Damn. <laughs> Ooh, I, I was surprised there wasn't a watchtower or <laughs> lighthouse or anything. Um, uh, or just some other creepy neighborhood. Just feeling that would totally freak anyone out who's been there uh yeah uh any uh, i'll i've I'll talked too much i'm gonna let anyone everyone else weigh in well uh i guess i'll step up here that uh the first film in particular i absolutely loved it up until like about the last 20 minutes or so oh good uh, that's the what divides everyone, so I, it's totally understandable. Uh, and the, the the main thing is that they were building the supernatural subplot so low key, so subtle, so chilling, and then just that part where he's meandering in the house with the baseball bat and suddenly the dead kids are all over. It's like, wow, just shoehorn that right in there, why don't you? Like the daycare from hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it Except it wasn't during the day. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I think that's just it. It's also playing on the whole idea that, you know, uh, material that uh, basically, you know, when all this stuff happens, when you're, you're sleepy, and so that's why it's hard to take it all in. You're already sleep deprived. And you're like, what was going on? <laughs> no intrusion. But and how, how long did he say he had the house? Like um, weeks, I think. Yeah, so it hasn't been long, and he's. <laughs> uh, but they, they they could have done that payoff better, in my opinion. Oh, good. Yeah. You mean the very ending with the with the axe? They, they they could have done the build up to that, the final revelation that okay, you put yourself in Bagul's path now. Better. Yeah, right, right. He goes, he gets with uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, who I, I'm surprised to see in this. He's the character who has to tell the guy the bad news. There's always one. He has to tell the the, the family, or the, you know, hey, you know, you're screwed. That was sort of his job yeah. in this movie. Yeah, yeah the, much the, like... The delivery in those lines was great about how, you know, not only did you put yourself in this path, you upped the timetable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he did a pretty laid-back voiceover here with this. So it was like, I totally bought him as the professor. Um, but... Uh, that that is a good point. He does just kind of just keep stating, not necessarily the obvious, but just saying, you know, this is time sensitive. This is you know, this is your time. Make use of it. Um, uh, going going back to that, uh, it's definitely a movie. Shit, I just had my thought. Um, I hate that. Uh, uh, what wasn't it interesting how uh, basically uh. Uh, there, there's a bunch of other just supporting. Uh, uh, well, uh, no, no, sorry. Okay, starting over. Uh, uh, it, it, it makes sense why D'Onofrio's in there because he and Hawk have been close buds since uh, Link Letters, uh, uh, the Newton Boys. So there you go. That's why they're in each other's movies. Ransone, pretty recently too. They were in this one uh, western together called In a Valley of Violence, and this movie called The Kid, which was about the outlaw Billy. So yeah, they're much like any other Brad Pack star or every other husband and wife team. They're just always just close and just star in each other's works. I was actually surprised uh, Frank Wally, you know, the, uh, the, the, does he look like a bitch victim from Pulp Fiction? Who's been in movies with them. Wasn't here also. <laughs> he, in fact, had this been in the nineties, I would have expected him to be the professor, but <laughs> Um, that would have been interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I guess uh, any other highlights just before we go on to the second movie? Um, the always great Fred Thompson as the sheriff. I, I can't look at him on screen without thinking of him from Hunt for Red October. Russia's yes. going to take dump zone without a plan. Exactly. Him and, and that, Law and Order and Cape Fear, you know, he's just as always... This was one of it, literally his last movie before he yeah, passed away. Must have been. Oh, wow. And I just have to say, I, the one thing I found most unbelievable about this film was this guy finds an old 8mm projector in his attic and he actually figures out how to use it. it you know, I would have had to go <laughs> that. Like, 
I, there's no way I could have figured out how to string that that uh, film through there. I just was like, really? He just figured that out? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I did it during college, and once was enough for me. Don't get me wrong. I Filming with it is great. You you have to make use of every minute. You time your shots. You you don't you shoot with a purpose that you can justify. It's great. It's I easier. Burned, to I would have burned my house down. Oh, uh, but that's just <laughs> it. Uh, loading it. Hire the person who kn- knows how to do it in the dark room because I'm not loading that fucking thing. Uh, just load it for me. I'll shoot it the way you want it at the meters you s- express. But don't you know? And I think that's just it too. You have to set the. Uh, uh, frames per second setting before you load it. So, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think, yeah, hire someone else to do it, and then let the, it. You can you can shoot it. It's easy, but it, it all that stuff getting prepped ahead of time, knowing what film to buy, expensive as hell. Yeah, no, fuck that. <laughs> uh, I guess another highlight for me would be the those snuff films themselves. Like for a PG thirteen movie, that is. Oh, this is our. Uh, and, and also, but they're also darkly funny because it's a parody of you know happy family activities and suburban life and that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. on the lawn is totally a happy family activity. Oh. <laughs> when yeah. I first. When I first watched this, the very first time I rented it, that very opening scene with the, with them being hung with the tree, I, it really caught my attention. It was very visually stunning. I thought that would be great. Oh, yeah. Open it. It's like, well, what the hell is going on here? You know, they're pissed off and, their guard for what? And the way there's no sound. Yeah, right, right. Very, very, <laughs> very, I thought that was very effective opening to catch your attention and invest you in what's going to come next. Yeah, I think also the, the soundtrack that comes up on some of these... Uh, these murder videos in the film. It's an odd soundtrack, but on a rewatch recently, I realized it's supposed to tie into the the idea that Bagul is this uh, forgotten Bab- Babylonian god. And yes. The music has this tribal quality to it that seems like it's part of a, a ritual sacrifice. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Someone was doing something just manson like in this house (laughs) oh uh so part two it's set uh trying to remember how many years uh they i swear they reveal it like it's been like five ten years something like that Mm. and i don't recall and they say it really briefly. Couldn't find anything online about it. Wasn't going to rewatch it. You know, I just, these movies were just kind of, they did what they needed to do. And I, you know, you know I'm so busy prepping for all the other movies for the podcast. I just had to say, uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll just take a risk. Uh, so this one definitely feels more to me like, uh, uh, I, I got parallels to other possessed house movies, uh, evil kid movies. <laughs> Uh, they kind of follow the same vein. Yeah. Uh, this one had a real Children of the Corn vibe to me. <laughs> Not a bad comparison. I, I definitely liked it better than Children of the Corn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll, I'll give you that. You didn't, you didn't miss all the shouting of, I love it. Uh, oh, the, 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 all I remember from Children of the Corn is just people just overreacting when they're with bloody faces. and. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, taking stock footage from other movies and the final one they did. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was a really awkward one, too. It was like, it didn't match up at all. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, this scored lesser. I, I kind of didn't mind it. Uh, uh, even though it was not hard to predict, I just, for whatever reason, just really dug uh, the deputy being in charge. And uh, uh, I wasn't familiar with uh, Kieran Foy uh films but uh he's apparently done some small obscure stuff like uh citadel in ireland which is known as a hoodie horror film i've never seen that yeah that's another one that kind of flew under the radar i think it came on chiller quite a lot uh, and like like this one it's a you know mix of mystery and horror uh so uh just i'll circle around again uh daniel weigh in um <laughs> Um, this one I would have to give like uh, we talking about like four stars. 
Uh, just out of five. You know, just... Out of five, I would give it a, a four. Okay. You know, for the most part, a very effective, very well-made, very atmospheric film, but that last 20 minutes. Ah. Right. It's every other Hollywood movie. I mean, I often will just have fun with just the chaos. I like, again, I can't help it. I like seeing people fight and just with what the fuck looks on their faces and all that. But uh, when you boil it down to if uh, like like you say, you always separate everything and layer everything. It's like, yeah, that thing felt a little typical ho- to Hollywood. <laughs> um, uh, Erica, so you watched these both in the theater. Uh, how, how was the Tom and Andy score? <laughs> in those speakers. Um. So so oh. sorry. Which score? Uh, the t- Tom and Andy. They're a, a sibling group who. An electronic duo who's scored a lot of stuff for movies, including oh. stuff for like The Strangers and uh, uh, Killing Zoe and Waking the Dead. So. <laughs> so, so they did the score for the first film. Sorry, I haven't really read the credits before we recorded this. No, all good. Uh, the, I, I first became familiar with them on one of the Resident Evil movies when I needed something to laugh at at the theater. I was like, "Wow, the score is actually pretty good." Um, I, I gotta say, I love the score in the first movie. Yeah, that one too wasn't wasn't bad. Uh, the last one I saw him score was the Silence, of Miranda Otto, Stanley Tucci horror film that premiered on Netflix. Um, uh, yeah, uh, basically, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how was the sound experience for either of these movies? <laughs> uh, I the, the... Oh, sorry. I, I feel like it was weaker in the second one. Gotcha. But okay. Not awful, but uh, but not as not as good. Gotcha. N- not used as effectively. Yeah, uh, I really only recall music. I don't really recall as many just visual effects, but uh, that makes sense. I mean, anything can be done better. And uh, 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 by this stage, you know, in in the late 2010s, it became very apparent when you know it was whether it was the theater versus a movie. It's like, yeah, it's definitely the movie. (laughs) And I mean, if you're seeing very fake looking CGI, chances are the sound mixing just isn't the best. So, I mean, uh, the first Hulk movie. Oh yeah. (laughs) Don't get me started. Uh, so, uh, uh, David, I'll I'll let you weigh in. Uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, obviously, I didn't like it as much either. I just watched it today, as a matter of fact. Um, I watched them back to back to kind of bone up. And uh, it, 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 uh, it, it tried too hard to make the deaths the centerpiece of the film. Where in the first one, they were interesting, but they, they served the story more. Where in the second one, it was more just like to freak you out. Kind of like I felt like what happened with the Saw movies. The first one had an interesting plot interesting story and, and some interesting deaths and then after that it was just let's see how we can kill people in different ways mm-hmm. and that, that, that's the vibe i got from this it was very much just let's come up with some more interesting ways to kill off uh, these families and it was it was too much of that and and also was it my imagination was bagul not in this movie at all except for just some uh, few fleeting moments he was hardly in it at all it was just, it was just these haunted fucking kids running around i think kids. He was in the spirit of the kid, but that I would need to literally rewatch it again and maybe even listen to a commentary. What was the intent? Because it is a little vague. Although he did still have, when he was in it, he still did have on his half in sport coat, so I dug that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, not, yeah. as, not as good. More like um, trying to go back to the well again and coming up. What do they call that? The diminishing returns? It, it, I, it's more or less, yeah. Um, what was uh? How do we feel how the deputy, the ex deputy at this point, uh, carries the movie, or does he kind of struggle? I, lo- I love this character. He was he's a little nerdy, kind of twitchy and nervous, mm-hmm. you know, but then tries to be the hero. Um, I felt like at first Sean and uh, Sosaman kind of carries the movie, and then uh, from that point on, then uh, you know, this is a new family that's moved in. Uh, uh, I guess I was just glad that they didn't do anything just stupid with the Scarecrow. <laughs> yeah, right. I've just seen too many killer Scarecrow movies. I liked how it was just a fake out there. It's like, okay, oh, thank you. Bubba. Oh, I like killer Scarecrow movies. Oh, well, 
in the right movie, yeah, but I, I've just seen so many ones where they just did it really dorky. Where it's like, this is just laughable. But wasn't there some talk that they were going to do a crossover with this franchise and Insidious? They were going to try to bring them together somehow. Uh, Jason Blum has talked a bunch of that. Um, I guess I was just was glad that it was its own universe here. I wouldn't have mind a uh, crossover with Deliver Us from Evil, which was a very similar movie. By Derrickson, uh, but yeah, I mean, Conjuring and <clears throat> Insidious and Annabelle. I mean, I think those guys have already figured out how to contain their own universe. So, <laughs> uh, and Pinhead was supposed to be in Freddy vs. Jason too. So, oh Jesus, who, who was uh, Pinhead. Pinhead? We talked about Hellraiser one for <laughs> ten last episode. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I missed that one. Boy, that's uh, that'd be tough to review some of those sequels. It, it really was a toughie, especially because we started differing on the different ones, civilly, mind you, but it was just interesting as hell. <laughs> Everybody had a different take on what was the best and worst part about those movies. It's like, no wonder this franchise <laughs> is the most parodied franchise. No one can come to any conclusion. I even started asking after myself afterwards, why was I even a fan? <laughs> <laughs> Well, just like this, the first one is interesting and, 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 and scary and has some cool stuff to say. And after that, it's just, how can we just dress up these people in freakish costumes after that? That's, I thought. Fair enough. I mean, I guess I'm just glad they didn't get to number three through six. You know, it's, uh, A ghoul dirt's... in space. Right, right, exactly right. <laughs> Jesus. They get some nanobites, nano, nanobots implanted in them or some shit. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Oh, God. I had to pick my main complaint about the second film. Um, it's the fact that you know, after that one kid you know, becomes possessed, he was, maybe he was always a bit of a psychopath or something, but um, it's like they, the, the ex-deputy and the, the mom just seem to be happy to move on with their lives. Like It doesn't seem like there's much of a grieving process there. It's like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> well, I we got rid of that asshole. Uh, I don't have <laughs> any of the physical media, but it did make me wonder, was there something deleted? You know? <laughs> or was it that written that way and they just didn't spend enough time on it because they were just spending so much time with all the other stuff? <laughs> oh. Couldn't find anything on whether that there was anything deleted, but anyone else can tell me wrong. Uh, well, hello. Any, anyone who thinks that the kid in the Babadook was annoying needs to Rewatch Sinister One. <laughs> you know, I didn't remember anyone about the Babadook. I just couldn't get into it, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, that kid was hella annoying. Man, I, I remember when, when my daughter was that it was tiny, and I know what it's like to go days without sleep, so I can totally appreciate what that mom was going through. Now, I didn't have a demon chasing me around, but other than that, <laughs> it was pretty accurate. Yeah. Uh, more or less, uh, it seemed like they they just ran out of time on the ending, and I know Sterickson was still creatively involved, so I, I don't I don't know what happened. Now this one was shot in Chicago, and uh, even outside uh, Grant Park, and, you know. So interesting. Um, there's not as much uh, music references. I I guess you could say starts out kind of as the focus on the family and then you know the deputies supporting then it becomes the deputies movie near the end um but yeah um uh, not as dense i uh, uh yeah i i have nothing else to add uh i know that uh other than uh i, I think this is it for the franchise it's done enough business and Jason Blum and Jerkson are, are ready to move on. Uh, uh, so where would you guys uh, rank this as their work? Is this their best or is this their semi good or is this lesser but watchable? Or... Um, I'd call it middling. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, it's, it's very good, but they definitely are capable of a lot more. For sure. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll let you guys just go around and rate it out of five stars, uh, each one. Oh, boy. No, the uh, second, 
I'll give the set the second one. I'll give it two out of five. Just not just 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 watered down. Um, not as interesting. You could tell they were trying too hard to make the kills more interesting, mm-hmm. and and, it, and I think it loses something when they do that. I, I prefer more story, less you know emphasis put on how cool the kills were. On the frills and chills and gore, yeah. And okay. The uh, father and the and the bastard father. I mean, the minute he steps on screen, he must have had a sign over his head. I'm going to <laughs> die horribly. Yeah, it did read like a blinking mark on his head. Uh, Erica, how would you rank either movie? Um, I, you know, I guess where I would give the Sinister one four out of five stars, I'll give the second one three out of five. All right. Yeah. And uh, Daniel, uh, you'll, I guess you'll also uh, rate this two or three or. Yeah, the, the the second one, I'm going straight down to a two. Okay. Oh, good. I'm gonna give both these probably a three and a half out of five they just i i don't I, I think they're very entertaining but like you say there there's just some small just imperfections that make a big, huge difference in the long run and that you don't really notice right away but after you finish watching it's like okay that sort of hit the mark but i i just didn't think it was the best uh blumhouse or derrickson but it was still an interesting premise so that's why it did business it was a return to haunted houses movies so uh yeah this has been very fun uh short and sweet uh tackling these movies i mean it makes a difference when it's just two movies <laughs> um yeah, they're the last time oh fuck i i had to just force myself <laughs> to wrap that up it was just way it's like yeah I I th- bad how many hell rated movies have there been now t- uh, 10 but oh, it then it man. got even wackier because yeah we had a comedian a stand-up comedian tiffany uh uh harding in her first episode and she was like oh man i'm gonna have to start using this material for my stand-up tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> he actually went to space like leprechaun and jason x and so yeah we, it was fun and then after a while i was like yeah let's just fucking end this already <laughs> one place not uh, man. my capital is up <laughs> <laughs> uh, god jesus so, uh, where can we find you all on the interwebs for those who don't pay attention to every other episode? Um, yeah. Well, uh, as always, the Nightmare Nerd is on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, you can find my articles on House of Tortured Souls, and I'm a regular contributor to the House of Screams podcast. Woo! There we go. <laughs> Hey, you can find my blog at myhorrificlife.com, and you can also find me on Instagram at myhorrificlife. Oh, yeah. And David, what are you jamming out to these days? <laughs> uh, oh, musically, I'm really into bad religion right now, but that's... Oh, uh, yes. Ooh. I, I, like, I like that angry punk rock. Surprise. Uh, Surprise uh, their music don't play more often in some movies because of their popularity, so interesting. Uh, I'm a big fan, but um, the only thing I've got is I'm on also on the House of Screams, uh, and I, I enjoy it greatly, and uh, thank you for letting me be on this one. Anytime. Uh, and, wow, this is probably the shortest episode we've done. <laughs> so far. Not that that's bad. I just, <laughs> everyone's got lives and everything. It's just interesting. <laughs> it's because it's a first. <laughs> Usually we get all vivid and... <laughs> You abuse a few substances. Yeah. (laughs) Anytime. Um, Short and sweet. Um, And uh, everyone, keep being cautious. uh, And uh, keep, as always, keep feeling pity for those less fortunate. And um, uh, keep reevaluating how you can just make just something, just a little minor adjustment that will make a difference and add extra happiness in this already uncivilized world. Absolutely. uh, I had to just recraft my bed made a difference I, I wake up very happy as opposed to with a sore back and pissed off so follow us on the web on facebook twitter and instagram the podcast is available on podbean spotify iHeartRadio, anchor apple and anywhere else podcasts are available feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites thanks a million for listening it's a jacked up review show